I didn't have an iPod. I couldn't get my email all the time, and people couldn't contact me all the time. So I don't think it made my life easier. <laughs> it made my life more difficult. But you know, life is like that, though. Things are not necessarily easier. Things are not uh, like that. But we, we kind of wish they, we, they were. And sometimes when we tell people when they come become a Christian that it's going to make everything so much easier. But it takes commitment. It takes strength. It takes heart to be a Christian. It takes integrity. It takes all kinds of things to become a Christian when you become a Christian. So it's not necessarily that it's going to be easier. But it's a great thing about being a coming Christian is that we're not doing it alone. It takes a, it takes, to become a Christian, it takes a person who realizes that they can't do it alone. Who knows that they, can't, they don't have the strength to, to go alone. It takes a person who knows that there's much more to life than what the world has to offer. It's not easy, but it's worth it. It's worth the effort. You see, it's, sometimes we think um, easier things are, are better. But the reality is usually, in most things in life, it's the things that take effort. That, in, that uh, are not the easy way that, uh, are, that make it uh, worth it. Um, last week when I went to after our service and after Sunday school, I went over to Jack Place Baptist Church, where the Filipino church meets, one of our sister churches. It was their anniversary <coughs> service last Sunday, and uh, Paul Johnson was speaking, and he talked about, some, at first it's difficult, and then it's, then, and, or at first it's hard to figure out, then it's difficult, and then it's done. And, he's, and basically he was talking about actually a mission trip they took to China, and how it wasn't easy. In fact, a lot of the they went into the area of China where they had the earthquake uh, about 16 months ago, 17 months ago, and they, they went in to work in, in uh, within an orphanage and work alongside the people there. And uh, they, I mean, they, they did all kinds of things. I mean, the, the bathroom situation wasn't great. He explained how um, basically it was a trough that was the washroom, and once a week they'd go in and wash it out. And so when they went into the washroom, they would, the guys would actually put cotton up their noses so that they could just managed to get in there, and, and, but they didn't, and then they, the sleeping conditions were, were much better because where they slept, they didn't go to a hotel, they stayed right, right in the orphanage, and uh, where they slept, the beds were, had, were infested with fleas, and, and all kinds of nasty things like that. So being a Christian sometimes is not the easiest route, it's not, it's not easy to follow Jesus, it takes a person that has, that has guts. It's worth the tears, worth the sweat, worth the pain, worth the cost. You know, you, the, the feeling that you gave, that, 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 that uh, gave you, that, that you were, we have when we accomplish something good, it's ten times that when we believe and follow in follow the footsteps of our Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take that feeling that you have when you've, seen, when you've done something that seems impossible, and times that by a hundred, and that's the way it is when we follow Christ.
Help us to know how to apply it to our daily lives. We pray for these things in your son's precious name. Amen. As we turn the Bible up into two, uh, in the verses into two sections, or three sections, I guess. And the first one is verses 57 and 58. And it says, As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. That's a big statement, isn't it? And then Jesus told them, Foxes have dens, and birds out of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Think about that for a moment. Now, is he trying to discourage him? I don't think so. I think what he's trying to say to him is, what you've said that you're going to do is not going to be an easy task. When you came to Christ, when I came to Christ, it, we, we, uh, we, need to, we need to understand that what we're, what we're committing to is not going to be just an easy road to walk down. It's not going to be clear. It's not going to be smooth. It's not going to be uh, uh, without holes and without pitfalls and without dangers. If you want to be a follower of Christ, it's going to take it's going to be a hard road to walk to follow Jesus. But life will not include a five-star hotel or a bed of roses. Now, does that sound like a, a, a really something to get charged up about? Isn't that something to make you want to jump in and get, get going? But you, you, you can be certain it will take a lot of guts to follow him. Think of Peter for a moment. Peter and some of the other disciples, they were jailed, they were beaten. Not easy road. You think of, of Stephen, a member of the Church of Jerusalem who, was, who went out and was, uh, who was voted on by the members and called out by the members to be one of the deacons of the church. And he goes out and preaches, and what did he get for his preaching? It wasn't a good salary. It was people throwing stones at him. And he was stoned dead. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 5 through 10, We'll turn over there quickly in that passage. We get a glimpse of what Paul saw. And you know what his testimony was for, for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 5 through 10, it says. Actually, I'm going to go to verse 3. I don't know why I read 5 to 10, but it says, We give no opportunity for stumbling to anyone so that the ministry will not be blamed. But in everything as God's ministers, we commend ourselves by great endurance, by affliction, or by hardship, by pressure, by beating, by imprisonment, by riots, by labors, by sleepless nights, by time, by times of hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the message of, of, of truth, by the power of God through weapons of righteousness and all, on the right hand and on the left. Through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, as deceivers yet true, yet unknown, yet, yet recognized, as dying and looking, and look, we live, as being chastened, yet not killed, as, as grieved, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet enriching many, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Everything that he says there is a contradiction in lots of ways, isn't it? He says, we're, we're poor, yet we're rich. We're dead, yet we're alive. We're beaten, yet we rejoice. We have, you know, all these different things that he has in that passage. As Paul is ministering, he, he's in, in, he's in, uh, uh, just escaping. He's, he's uh, experienced many different things. Not all of them wonderful, but the wonderful thing that he has seen is the lives that have been changed, the lives that have been enriched, the lives that have been influenced. Love the love of God. So, in other words, you know, you and I, as we, as we, as our followers of Jesus Christ, we may not have an easy road to go. You know, there's some that I that I've, I've experienced, some that I've met that have seem to have everything, even as believers in Christ. Yet, there's many of us who have nothing. Not, I don't think ever I'll be a rich man. I don't think ever my family will be uh, living in a mansion, but not here. Anymore. We have something to look forward to that has eternal significance. That's something to look forward to that we can, when we follow Christ is the reward that comes at the end. You know, it's not easy, but it is worth it. It'll be hard, but what we experience in the short term will be worth it in the eternal. When you think of what your short term hard hardships may be, in the long term, God will make it worth our while. And then we go on to verse 59 and, and 60. And he says there, and Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, and then he says,
said to another, follow me. The Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he told them, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. <coughs> now, this sounds like an interesting way to tell them any dead can't bury the, the, the dead, can they? But what he's telling them is that, that you're, you're, I, what's likely here is that his father hasn't died, but his father may not be well, his father may be elderly, and so that he, he, might, he might need some help. But what Jesus is saying, let those who are left behind take care of them. If you want to follow me, I want, because I want you to follow me, I want you to go no matter what you might experience. Now that is one of the hardest things I think ever to do. Because one of the things that uh, being in the ministry as, as, that I've experienced is there's been times when my grandmother was dying and I couldn't go to see her. There was a time when my grandfather passed away and I couldn't go. And you know, those are, those are really tough times. But my task, the job that God's given me is to call me away from our family. And you know, sometimes he may call us away and that we need to be sure that we are willing to make a commitment to him. So when all when this is all done, then he would need to be committed fully to, to Jesus completely. That's what he's calling, telling him here to do. He says, you can't just, uh, don't worry about what was going on back at home. You follow me, because we need to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. Because what Jesus is asking him to do is more important than the family now. They become secondary to our following of Jesus. Now that's tough, isn't it? Hard to, hard to, uh, to see. But, but will Christ be, what, when you think of, the, of those around us who are dying and are, and are lost, what becomes more important? Our finances, our home, our parents? All these must not get in the way of us going out to share the gospel. And then he goes on in verse 61 and 62. He says, Another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me say, say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, to, looks back, at, pardon me, and no, no one who, let me say that again, no one who puts his hand to the plow, ha, can I get the word out there, can I? Let's start again, one more time, right? And then Jesus said to him, No one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever done any farming. Likely, looking at the crowd that we have here today, there's no farmers here. But, if you've ever been work, worked in a field, the important thing is, is, if, is to keep your eye focused on the, in the, in the, down the field so that you can keep a nice straight path. So now, if you've driven a car, you know this too. Some people, if you look, watch Canada's Worst Drivers, you need to learn this kind of stuff. But some people, they, as soon as they look over their shoulder, they're floating into the other lane. Or if, they, if, you're, if you're a runner. Now, if a runner looks over his shoulder, often what happens? The guy that he's looking over his shoulder for passes him. You know, they lose your focus. You lose, lose track. You get out, of, get out of your lane. And you, and you're, it's, you just create a mess for yourself. So what Jesus is telling them here is, you, if I called you and you've committed to follow me, you can't be looking back and wondering what's happening behind you. You can't be looking back and worrying about what, what's happened in the past. You can't be looking back and saying, oh, I need to go back, I need to go do something else. Because once you do that, you get distracted, you, you don't get the, the task completed that he's called you to. That's tough. That's a, that's a tough thing to do. Because most of us are always, we always want to look back. You know, I thought about this too, as I think about, about hitting when, when you're playing, playing baseball. Have you ever tried to hit a baseball? As soon as you, what you're told to do is keep your eye on what's coming at you so you can hit it. A lot of times, you know, people start thinking about their swing, start thinking about how the, their mechanics and all these kinds of things, and they get off the focus of what they need to do, and they miss all the other now, if you've ever played fast pitch baseball, the ball comes at you pretty fast. As soon as you take your eye off the ball, it, 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 you're in trouble. Now, when I, I tried, that's what I played growing up for a long time. And then when I went to get to Oklahoma, they played this, game, this slow pitch game. The silliest game I've ever tried to play. I've never struck out, it's been years since I've struck out in baseball. But this white baseball will come at you like it's as big as a 
so slow, it was like as big as a, a watermelon. And, I, and, and I'm so used to swinging at a fast pitch ball that I struck out. So I, the first time I missed it, I couldn't believe it, right? So the next time I'm thinking about my swing, I'm thinking about all these different things, I'm looking back and making sure, you know, looking at my stand, and doing you know, all these things, and every, the ball came three times, I, three pitches, I struck out. I couldn't believe it. I've never had done that in my life. I thought, this, this, can't, this game is too easy. But then I, when I got up to the bat, I started, I started thinking about other things, and looking back, and thinking about all the, you know, all this other stuff, where my bat was and all this. I wasn't watching the ball as it came. And then, I, you know, I just, I messed up. You and I, when we're called to follow Jesus, when he says, come and follow me, we can't be looking back. We can't let our families determine how we follow Christ. We can't let our friends determine how we follow Christ. We can't let our experiences determine how we follow Christ. We can't let anything get in the way of us following Christ. If we do, we won't get the task done. We won't get the job completed. When we look at Jesus, what he, what he told us in John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, he said, the way I work is I keep my eyes on the Father. I see what he does, and then I follow him. You and I, we want to, we want to follow Christ. We want, to, we, we want to do what he's called us to. We want to be one of his disciples. We must keep our eyes on him so that we can see what he's doing, and we can join him in, in that work also. If you want to do amazing things for our Lord, you must keep your eyes on Him. If you want to do amazing things in your life, if you want to do the impossible, if you want to do the things that you didn't think possible, you need to follow, keep your eyes on Him. When Jesus came to the, to the end of His ministry, He could have become distracted. He could have let the world be His guide. He could have let, could have led an uprising to be king, because they would have made Him king. And, and He could have led, led uh, could have been a leader, but no he followed the will of the Father and went to the cross to bring salvation to you and I. What Jesus accomplished had eternal significance in this world, especially for me, for you, because without it, we wouldn't have salvation. If he would allow himself to get distracted and, be, and, and follow the Satan's, his temptations to him, if he would have followed what the people really wanted him to be, where would we be today? You can let the world affect your, your life. You can let you can follow the or you can follow the Lamb of God and help change the world. What do you follow? But it's gonna take some guts. I read a story this week that I thought was kind of interesting and appropriate to this. It said, when Julius Caesar landed on the shores of Britain during the first century with the Legion of Romans, Roman legions that he brought, brought ashore, he took a bold and decisive step to ensure the commitment of his men. He ordered them to march to the cliffs of Dover and where and there he, they, they could see every ship. Every ship which had, they had just finished crossing the English Channel and that he had set fire. Caesar had burned the ships and eliminated the possibility of retreat. With a new sense of urgency and tenacity, Caesar and his armies conquered Britain. You see, we need to burn those ships that will distract us and cause us to think that we can retreat. We need to set those things aside and out of our sight that is going to allow us to, to not be victorious in Christ. Is your family keeping you back from following you? Is your job keeping you from following you? Is your education keeping you from following you? Are your finances? You know, our Delmi this last two weeks are in a challenge right now for our family. Two weeks ago, uh, Adele was let go of her job, as many of you know. And the first thing, the natural thing to do is panic and lose sight of what God has called us to do and to, and, and in, our, in our ministry. And the 
let those things be our God. Let those things, you know, our worry and, our, and everything. And we've had to really pray and ask God, help us to keep our focus on you through even this difficult time. We can't let the things of this world distract us from following our Lord and Savior. What's keeping you from following Christ today? Stop making excuses. Burn whatever ships are keeping you from looking back instead of plowing forward for the glory of God. It takes guts, it takes guts to stop making excuses and to follow Jesus as your Lord of your life. You see, a lot of us receive salvation, but the next step is to be sure that we make it the Lord of our life. Saying that you are in charge. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do whatever you call me. Because in this room today, there may be someone here that is supposed to be a pastor. There may be someone in here that needs to be a teacher. A Sunday school teacher. There may be someone in here that needs to be a, a, a music leader, a worship leader. There may be someone in here that needs to be a missionary. I don't know what God's calling you to There may be someone in here that just needs to be willing to say, yes, I'll follow you. I'll make you Lord of my life. And receive him as Savior. I don't know what God is saying to you, but it's time to stop making excuses. And trust him. The song that we're going to sing next, we're going to have um, the girls in Austin come, <laughs> is, is I have decided to follow Jesus. And as you sing this song, I want you to think about the words that we're singing this morning. That God is calling you to follow, follow Him. Calling you to, to go wherever He would lead you. The question I'm asking you this morning is, will you? And will you be able to sing the words of this song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.